The ancient witness for today is from Esther 7, verses 1 through 3. So the king and Haman went to dinner with Queen Esther. At this second dinner, while they were drinking wine, the king asked again, Queen Esther, what would you like? Half of my kingdom? Just ask and it's yours. Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your eyes, O King Xerxes, and if it pleases the king, give me my life and give my people their lives. I have had a few pets throughout my life. I've spoken about uh, a dog I help care for, uh, Phoebe, even at one time we've talked about that. Well, my first pet was a cat, and her name was Miss Kitty. I was a young boy, and I was either lacking creativity or expressing a deep concern for clarity. <laughs> which is important, by the way. So it goes without saying that I have an affinity for cats. <clears throat> and one of my favorite cats' name is Marble. Marble lives in Go. And every now and then, I'll get a text with a picture of Marble sometimes in a box. Marble loves to be in a box. It's my very own uh, cat meme of sorts. Speaking of memes, <laughs> scholars say those days to the 1990s when email allowed office workers to bounce funny cat pictures around. Then, of course, through texting and social media apps, it followed. And I remember seeing the many grumpy cat memes over time. Perhaps you have, too. And according to scholars of media history, these memes of cats date back to the late 1800s, actually, long before the Internet. It seems there was an overabundance of postcards with pictures of cats posing like people and posing like royalty sometimes. To give it a name, it's called Edwardian Postcard. And the first postcards were made in Europe in the 1860s, and they spread like wildfire, wildfire with the expansion of postal services across the world. They were cheaper, they were faster, and they were certainly more convenient than sending letters. Postcards could be used to share random musings, to plan out where and when people could meet. They were used to tell jokes, and of course, they were used to send cat pictures. So postcards marked a changing world and a startling advance of information technology. Ideas and information could be transported rapidly across a large distance. One person even noted that if you were traveling from Manhattan to Jersey City, you could send a postcard at 10 a.m. announcing that you would be there by 5.30 that afternoon. That's how quickly these were spreading. And for the, perhaps the first time in history, rapid communication was affordable and accessible. Millions of postcards circulated. Some, some postcards featured cats just being cats whether sipping milk or playing with yarn, 
Others featured cats dressed up as humans at work or tending to a family. Many postcards were sold for fundraising causes, and some of the most famous postcard cats are ones associated with the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Historians say that the participants in the women's suffrage movement successfully waged a campaign to persuade an all-male electorate to change voting laws that would allow women to vote. Postcards were a crucial part of this success. And just like email, it was inexpensive and it was personal. So says one historian. So speaking of history, our ancient witness for today comes from the book of Esther. Esther is a short story set in the Persian Empire, which ruled the ancient Near East across Iran and Egypt, and that was 539 to 332 BCE, before it fell to the Greek Emperor Alexander the Great. Esther is, a, is an exciting, fast-paced story that takes place at the Winter Palace in Susa, that's east of Babylon. So Esther was a young Jewish woman whose parents had been carried away into exile in Persia. And after her parents died, she came to live with her uncle Mordecai, who was a palace official in the court of King Xerxes. And as the plot in the text moves forward, Xerxes selects Esther to be the queen. And this was a miraculous turn of events, as there was a man named Haman who absolutely hated the Jewish people. He was the prime minister for the king and enacted a plan to eliminate the Jewish people in a genocide. So throughout the story, the king is never quite sure what to do. Completely at the mercy of his ministers and his servants, he gives away his power without even a thought. And Haman, on the other hand, is an erratic egomaniac who is concerned only for his own honor and enemy's disgrace. So one day, Esther summons the king and Haman together. She reveals her identity as Jewish and then begs for her life and the lives of her people as you read in the text before. And in doing so, she takes a risky stand. But she knows that the king is ruled by his own selfish concerns and would be much more affected by the loss of his wife than by the slaughter of an entire group of his subjects. And in the end, the king honors Esther's request and punishes Haman. The Jewish people are saved, and Esther is a shero for all intents and purposes. Now, Esther risked her comfort, her status, and her very life to do what she did. She knew the king, though, and she knew affecting change was important. She saw that she, ma she was made to be queen for such a time as this. She knew that her life meant something and that she had a cause to live for, that she could reverse the power structure that threatened her existence. And this story serves to highlight the difference between the king's perceived power and Esther's lived power 
when the king follows through on Esther's suggestion. Now, few, if any of us, know the impact we make as individuals. Those in power would have us believe that we have no ability to affect change by ourselves. Ultimately, though, everything depends on each individual. Every single interaction we have in the world has a potential to change everything. Queen Esther, a consummate survivor, thus offers an intriguing answer to the challenge to be proactive about our own future. So while the powerful appear in control, there is an unseen hand at work in all things, leading to great reversals. And though God is never explicitly cited in this book, the book shows a greater power at work throughout. God is subtle to a fault here, and yet, if we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, we may be able to discern where God is acting in our lives. The book of Esther teaches that God is able to work through willing people to ensure justice. In other words, justice comes from people exercising their abilities to make a difference. Now, climate scientist Ayanna Johnson says it like this. She says, sometimes the bravest thing we can do while facing an existential crisis is imagine life on the other side. Johnson is working to help create the best possible climate future. She suggests asking yourself three questions. One, what are you good at? To think about your skills, your resources, and networks, and consider what you can bring to the table. Two, she asks, what work needs doing? To think about systemic changes and justice solutions to focus on. And three, she asks, what brings you joy and satisfaction? What causes you to get up in the morning? To think about actions that energize and enliven you, as if, act as if you love the future. So Esther was an orphan who was both female and Jewish, and one who cared about her future and the future of her people. As a female, she was the least powerful member of the less powerful gender, and as Jewish, she was among a powerless people in the mighty Persian Empire. And although that was a tale in ancient history, some things, in conclusion I'll say, some things persist across generations and media. The struggle of power to hang on to power and the struggle for justice. Oh, and depictions of cats, too. People are still all about the cat but I think people are all about justice too. Justice for each other. Amen.